This is how I debate with ChatGPT to learn and understand any topic and also to nail down my ideas, to clarify them, to solidify them. Okay, and I'm gonna walk you through a story. This is my full chat that I had with ChatGPT and it got me to completely understand a problem that I was working with. Okay, let's go through this. So this is my story. It's all gonna relate back to AI in a second. So just stick with me here. So I have a gym problem. I've been working out for a while now. I absolutely love the gym. I'm primarily a power lifter, but of course I like the muscle gain from strength training. And a primary principle with any type of lifting is progressive overload. So quickly, progressive overload means that in order for you to keep increasing in strength, muscle size, endurance, whatever you're shooting for, you have to continue to do more the next week than you did the previous week. So that could be adding more weight to the bar, that could be adding more reps, more sets, a lower rest time, a longer range of motion. Whatever it is, you have to be progressive overloading because your body adapts to the stress stimulus that it had the week before. Okay, this is principle number one when it comes to working out. If you don't satisfy this principle, you will not grow, you will not gain, you will not improve. So I had a question and I wasn't able to find the exact answer I wanted through Google. So I wanted to try with ChatGPT. And ChatGPT is smarter than any person, workout coach, anybody that you can possibly ask this question to. So my question was pretty much, can you still gain muscle if progressive overload is not applied? And the reason why I'm asking this question is because I was burning out and I needed a deload week. A deload week is like a rest week where you give your body a chance to recover from the stresses that you had weeks, months, years before. And you usually know when you need a deload week, when you're not eating as well, sleeping as well, you feel irritable, you feel overtrained and weak. You know, you're starting to plateau on your lifts. You're not increasing the weight anymore. My joints were achy. But just like my business OCD, I got a little bit of gym OCD where I feel like I'm wasting time if I'm not improving each and every workout. I'm obsessed with gaining. So I didn't want to feel like I was wasting a workout if I went in and I did the same exercises, the same weights, the same reps, the same sets that I did the week before. It was really bugging me because I knew I had to do it but I also wanted to ensure that I was still gaining muscle. So my side question was, can doing the same workout each week still gain muscle? And if so, is it a sliding scale of decrease? And what I mean by that is, let's say your workout this week all improves on the workout last week. Are you gaining 100% of the muscle because of the stimulus? And if you did that exact same workout the week after, would it be 0%? You know, that didn't make much sense. How about 90%, 90% of the full muscle gained? But I didn't understand. If your body's adapting to the workout before, how can doing the same workout the next week still gain muscle? I hope you're sticking with me here. It was a complicated problem. And the point of all this is, I didn't really know what I wanted to ask. I have a bunch of questions, I have a bunch of ideas, and I needed someone to flesh this out with. So who better than ChatGPT, the world's greatest gym coach. So when I like to debate with ChatGPT, I actually like to use ChatGPT voice. And this is how it looks on your smartphone. So right now you can only do it through the app, the ChatGPT official OpenAI app, but you can actually talk to it. And this is easier because I don't have an exact idea. So I just wanna just like word vomit everything that's in my mind into the text box and then have GPT-4 kind of turn that into a question. And I'm gonna click play here. See, this is how it works. Like you talk to it right here, and when you're finished, it will think a bit, it will convert your voice to speech, and then it will talk back to you exactly what it would write in the GPT-4 chat. So you can either read it or you can just listen to it right here. And it has some good natural sounding voices. Let's see if I can get one for you. Can you say hello to YouTube for me? Sure, I'd be happy to help with that. What would you like me to say to YouTube? Okay, that was an example of how it sounds. And where I like to do this is, I like to do this on long drives. So the other day I had a long drive to Toronto. It was about a two hour drive. I hooked my phone up to one of these car holders here and I just talk back and forth with ChatGPT. And its voice comes over the speaker and it's like I'm having a debate in my car. What better way to learn than when you're driving around? Okay, so I'm in my car, I'm debating with ChatGPT and I'm trying to flesh out this idea. And now here's the chat. I'm gonna give you guys a sneak peek to kind of how this goes. 
how this looks when you're debating via the voice and how ChatGPT can help you come to a conclusion. So first, sometimes I like to ask it if it's GPT-4 or GPT-3.5. I've had a couple times where it was GPT-3.5 for some reason, and the answers were never great. So I always like to start off with that question. So it answers that's based on GPT-4 so we can start. And here's a little insight to how it works when you're just talking. As you can see, it's not polished. It's a pretty random type of text. But again, this was just word vomit from my mind. So I asked, okay, my question is about working out. So let's say I have a workout, I have a full body workout, and I do a certain amount of weights, reps, and exercises, and rest time, okay? And let's say I built 100% of my muscle from that workout. If I went back three days later after I recovered, okay, so all things being equal, perfect recovery, all that type of jazz, and I did the exact same full body workout, okay? So I did all the same exercises, I did the same weights, I did the same rest times, all that stuff. Would I gain muscle mass in that second workout? Or did I gain all the muscle possible in that first one because of progressive overload? And that next one, because I did the same thing, my body already adapted and I did not gain any muscle. See how natural that sounds? I have like a bunch of okays. During the real voice, I think I was pausing a bunch of times. I didn't quite know what I wanted to say. But in this big block of text, ChatGPT was able to understand my question. And it starts with, that's a great question. Progressive overload is the idea of gradually increasing the stress placed upon the body during exercise training. It's a foundational concept in resistant training and is essential for muscle growth over time. So it kind of took what I was talking about, concised it for me, and then spit out an answer. Now, I'm not going to read the whole conversation here because it's pretty long, but there are a few major points that I want to touch on. So it goes on to say, however, just because you perform the same workout doesn't mean your body won't benefit or gain muscle from it. And here's why. It says the body doesn't work on a strict percentage of muscle gain per workout. Repeating the same workout still provides stimulus for muscle growth. But eventually though, doing a workout with the same parameters, your progress will plateau. So it says to answer your question, yes, doing the exact same workout a few days later would still gain muscle. But I wasn't done. I wanted it to give me actual numbers. I thought this answer was more fluff and theory, and I wanted to break it down. So I go. And again, we're having a conversation. The point of this is to have a conversation like you would with a real person. They give you an answer, you ask additional questions, you clarify on that answer, and you keep digging and digging and digging until the answer resonates with you. So I go, yeah, I'm just more curious about, so let's say that first workout gave you 100% of the muscle gain. Would that second workout give you 95%, 90%, higher, lower? If I did the same workout 100 times in a row, and then I give an example. So one workout, rest three days, did that same workout, repeat that for 100 times. By the 100th workout, am I only gaining like 5% of the possible muscle because my body's adapted so much? And then it goes, I understand what you're getting at. Let's try to conceptualize this with some hypothetical numbers. But keep in mind, these are just illustrative and not scientifically accurate. Look, it got what I was trying to ask. First workout, 100% muscle gain. Second workout, exact same routine let's say 95% of the initial gain, third workout, maybe 90%, and so on. By the time you get to the 20th workout, maybe you're only seeing 50% of the muscle gain. And it asks me, does that help to visualize the concept better? And I go, yes, it does, but I want to continue. Where are you drawing this information from? It sounded like it was just making up numbers. And I asked, has there been a study that has tried to replicate this or get an answer to this question? And then I go on to talk about RPE. I bring what RPE is into this. It's basically how hard you perceive the set. 10 out of 10 meaning you can't do another rep if your life depended on it. One meaning you can do maybe nine more. And we know that lowering RPE is good for the body, mind, and soul because it's better for recovery. If that initial workout was a 10 RPE and then five workouts later doing the exact same workout, it would technically lower your RPE. Would you gain more muscle mass later on? And then ChatGPT brought up periodization, basically saying, that cycling through phases of volume and intensity to optimize gains and minimize the risk of injury is beneficial and many high level athletes do do this. And then it talks about why someone would want to progressively overload each week instead of staying at the same workout. And it gives me three reasons, psychological benefits, breaking plateaus, and specificity. So it answered how much of a decrease each week that doing the same workout might lower your muscle adaptation. Right now, I understand it better, but at the time, I still couldn't visualize it. It still wasn't resonating with me. So the amazing thing with ChatGPT, and this completely changed everything, was I asked it. I still can't visualize. 
can you give me examples from other areas of biology to nail the point home? I want it to give me metaphors, analogies, whatever it could to help me understand what it was trying to say. Like I had my own professor in front of me. And so I asked it, hasn't there been a study that has directly quantified the diminishing returns of adaptation? And I got those words. This was the keyword I was searching for. And I got this through a chat GPT answer, right? Diminishing returns of muscle gain. These were the words I was looking for to help better craft my question. And I got it from an answer. And now that I have these keywords, I was able to ask it, can we draw from any other field where human adaptation has been studied and we can see a diminishing return to the same stressor? And this is where everything eventually clicked home. It said the principle of diminishing returns is seen across multiple fields and one of the most studied areas outside of fitness where adaptation occurs is in pharmacology. Bang, that hit home. That makes perfect sense. Drugs, and we all know this with tolerance. You take the same drug over and over and over again, week after week, your body gains a tolerance to that stressor and you get diminishing returns of the drug's effectiveness. And that's been well studied. You know, if the initial dose provides 100% efficacy, the next time it might be 80%, then 75, then 72 on a sliding scale. That's exactly the same as a workout stressor. You know, your body adapts to the initial workout and it's almost like it gets a tolerance to that workout by growing muscle size, increasing your neuron strength, your cardiovascular improvement. And it gives me another example in learning and memory. There's the spacing effect. You know, it's why you can't cram for a test. You start to forget information. Cramming for information is almost like a stressor for the brain, for the mind. You have diminishing returns. So with spaced repetition, it's almost like a workout. You know, you have to work out, let your muscles recover, let's say for three days, and then you can work out again. It's the same thing with spaced repetition and learning. The stressor is the information in your mind. Wait 24 hours, 48 hours, whatever. Try to learn that information again. It's better to stick the more times you do spaced repetition. And that helps me draw the parallels to fitness. And now after that example, I get it. Everything clicked. I debated with ChatGPT, I asked it questions, and I was able to finally find an answer that resonated with what I understand about the world. And to just finish this conversation up, now that I understood it, I wanted to dive a bit deeper into the theory of why this is. And I talked about a universal rule of biology about life. It's interesting about adaptation to the same stressor. I just kind of want to know why. Why is this a thing? Why doesn't the body adapt 100% to one stressor? And it says that evolution is a process of gradual change over time. So that's the same with tolerance and diminishing returns. It's a gradual change over time. And I found that so interesting. But I wanted to know why. Why does it not entice the full amount of change in one time? And I don't want to toot my own horn, but it thought it was a deep and profound question. I got the AI to think. And it gave me the reason why there isn't a full 100% correction each time. And this made perfect sense. Cells are very complex. So each of these pathways might adapt at different rates. That's fully understandable. Energy conservation, it's very energy intensive for the body to make big changes. So adapting slowly is better for energy conservation. It protects against overcorrection, and I love this one. Let's say your body did adapt 100% to a stressor instantly. What if that adaptation turns out to be detrimental? It would completely kill the probability of survival. And that makes sense, right? What if you don't want to overcorrect? What if the stressor is bad? Bringing this back to fitness, what if you wanted to get big and ripped one day, but the next day you wanted to be skinny and lean? You wouldn't want to overcorrect 100% in one direction and then try to bring it back. It talks about redundancy. And this helps with survival. If one system fails, others can still take over. It talks about the fact that it's time dependent. Protein synthesis, tolerance, all that takes time. It takes time for the body to synthesize new proteins. It all can't happen at once. And then variable sensitivity. Not every cell in the body will have the same sensitivity. And that's similar to point number one with the cellular complexity. Each pathway adapts at different rates. So again, this is how I debate with ChatGPT to find answers to my questions. I think it's better than debating with a human because even if you don't have a concrete idea, you just have a bunch of gibberish, the beautiful thing about GPT-4 is it can turn that gibberish into a more concise and proper question. So not only does it answer your question, 
it formats your question so that you can better dig to the root problem. And if you want to copy my same process, you know, this works best for me. You know, I like to use chat GPT voice. I like to talk to it. And you do this with the OpenAI app. And I do that in my car. I have a smartphone holder that attaches to my window and I just talk to it while I'm driving. So good luck debating with chat GPT.